Hi there, my name is James Scott and welcome to Valley to Vietnam. Valley to Vietnam is a joint venture between the Sacramento Public Library and the Vietnam Veterans of America Chapter 500. Uh, it's our intent to trace the arc of experience of our local Vietnam veterans as they went from the Sacramento Valley to Vietnam and then back again. I am here today with Mike, Michael Halderson. Michael, it's very nice to meet you. And, it's nice to meet you. And thank you for letting us into the splendor of your wonderful home. Michael is a veteran of the U.S. Navy and served on the USS Hopewell in the South China Sea in the, uh, the Vietnam Theater. So um, it's great to be here. And we are in Chico, which is one of those magical places um, in California. You talk to a number of different folks. Um, and invariably smile comes to their face when you mention Chico. So Michael grew up in Chico. Tell us a little bit about uh, that experience, being here as a kid, and of course, Bidwell Park, a big part of that. I, I loved Bidwell Park. We had many, many picnics out there as, uh, as a family, and uh, <clears throat> I played out there, mainly cowboys and Indians. Right. For some reason, I was always the Indian with the bow and arrow. <laughs> Don't know how that happened, but um, it, it was just a magical time. One Mile Dam was a huge swimming uh, pool okay. uh, where they actually had um, um, water ski jumpers. They had a Jeep connected to it on the other side, and it was just... Oh. It was just so different to see something like that in a swimming pool. So, so um, even today as you go around Chico, um, Bidwell lives on, but does it have the same kind of charm that you remember? I mean, obviously population uh, increases affect things, but what do you think? Well, Chico's changed a lot, just like everything. It's, uh, um, it's got its problems, but it's got its beauty and its history. and. And I feel very fortunate to be a member and a citizen of Chico. And of course you have Chico State too, which we're gonna talk yes. quite a lot about mm -hmm. as, as we, we move along. So, so you've, you're growing up and you have the, the public school sort of experience and you move into adolescence. Tell us a little bit about being a teenager in Chico and um, some of the most sort of salient memories from, from that stage in your life. Well, uh, being a teenager, both high school and then the first years in, at Chico State, um, you know, you, you get your first car, um, you go to the, all the hangouts like Snow White Drive-In, A&W Root Beer, yeah. and it's just seeing all your buddies, it, uh, it was a good time. Did you, be, being where Chico is geographically, um, you've got ready access to a lot of nature around you. And I know camping and being in the outdoors is a part of your life now. Did you do much of that when you were a kid? Only as a Boy Scout. Okay. Um, my parents didn't really camp much. Okay. But, but you can recall doing, doing yeah. things in as fact, a Boy Scout. out into Bidwell Park and learning, learning about, about nature. nature. And yeah, it was, it was a good time. As you started to move through high school and and start to look at your future. What were some thoughts? I mean, what was your sweet spot for what interested you? Well, in high school, I was an art major. And okay. um, I told my counselor when I went to Chico State that I wanted to be a, uh, an art major. Okay. And he informed me that I couldn't be because Sputnik had gone up and there had to be people to build uh, things for the space race. So. I was put into industrial arts for two years and uh, just changed my major to art in the fall of 63, but I'd already majored in girls, cars, booze, job, and 15 and a half units. Nobody can survive that, and I didn't. So Chico State sent me a letter asking me not to return for a while, and I'd already gone to officer candidate school in the summer of 63 okay. Okay. and was going to go back in the summer of 64 but I wasn't there so I decided to get my active duty out of the way okay. and I went active um, to Treasure Island and then joined the USS Hopewell in June of 64. So what are some of your um, 
your more prominent memories from being at Treasure Island? Well, let's see, I was at uh, electronics technician A school and learning about electronics and uh, it was very warm in the in the buildings there was no oh, okay. air conditioning they didn't they thought they didn't need it they thought I thought they, they did right. yeah <laughs> um, I remember meeting some nice guys and then all of a sudden they were gone because we were all in transit barracks they went their way I went my way buying a car that had a stick and trying to navigate the hills in San Francisco, in San Francisco. is a challenge yeah. I remember that um, it was a 64 Chevelle four speed with a 283 and it was Raider colors, silver and black. Oh, a bunch yeah. of us decided we would go over and, and uh, go to the movie, The Longest Day. Oh, right. Okay. Now there's a nice four hour war movie or whatever it, it length it was. And none of us could buy liquor to go uh. in and, and watch this movie. So we needed to find some angel to do that for us. Well, it turned out to be a hell's angel that uh, bought it for us. Okay. And we all went in with our um, half pint, what is that? Sure. You know, whatever okay. it is. Yeah, yeah. In our jumpers. And unfortunately, the movie theater had uh, a broken ice machine. So we poured our bourbon into warm Coke. Oh. Well, that's not good. Your Treasure Island and your your sort of uh, you, you've mustered for the for the Navy, but let's go back to the question: um, why why the Navy? Well, <clears throat> uh, I just graduated from high school in in um, June of sixty one, okay. and I don't even know how it happened, but I ran into this old machinist mate chief John Hammonds from Chico, California, and he said something very um, important to me. He said, now, in a nuclear war, would you rather be on land or way out in the sea where they can't find you? Well, that kind of resonated with me and thought, well, okay, all right, the Navy's for me. And so I joined the Naval Reserve in, on September 13th, 1961. As you're growing up in Chico, um, your family has a business, correct? Mm, not so much. Okay. Um, it, 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 it evolved into a business. Okay. My dad was a technician for Montgomery Wards, fixing TVs and lawnmowers and washing machines. Okay. And so um, he started his own business in 61, just as I graduated from high Got school. It. We're at Treasure Island, and tell us about your transition to the South China Sea, if you could. Uh, well, once again, I found out that I didn't particularly like electronics, so I was shipped down to the USS Hopewell in June of 64. And uh, at that point, there was no war going on. The Gulf of Tonkin happened in August of 64, just as we were deploying for Westpac. And uh, so I joined my ship as a deck ape. That's the lowest of low. That's the guy that's chipping paint and swabbing the decks and all this stuff. And went mess cooking. Uh, they sent me mess cooking. And so as I was uh, uh, assisting the cooks, I found out that they don't have to stand underway watches. Okay. And so that appealed to me. So I wanted to be a cook really bad. So I started studying the manual to become an E4 cook. And I was standing mess decks inspection one day, and the XO came aboard, uh, came down to our compartment, and he goes, hey, Halderson, I see you're striking for commissary man. And I said, yes, sir. And he goes, no, you're not. He said, I didn't approve a CHIT. A CHIT is a request form. Got it. Okay. okay. And so now I'm devastated. I think he could see it on my face, how devastated I was that I would have to be going back to the deck force. Okay. So later on the day, I'm out on the fan tail, fanning, you know, getting sun, and, and uh, he comes out and he says, Halderson, I see you've had two and a half years of college, and in junior high, you had typing. I don't know where uh, he got that thing, yeah. but, and he said, I need a yeoman. And I said, I'm your man. Okay. So then I became a yeoman, and that's, it, it come to find out, it all works out. I really like paperwork. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. what yeomen do. They're like clerical workers. Okay. Okay, so so you're a yeoman, but you also, as we talked about earlier, uh, everybody's got general quarters posts. So where were yours? Okay, uh, when I first went aboard my ship, um, I was a fuse setter in Mount 51. That's a five-inch uh, gun on the forward part of the ship. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> then I was transferred to a second loader in a three-inch 50, which is an anti-aircraft. Uh, battery uh, where you, you take the the ammo from the bulkhead and put it into a hopper that's fed into the the gun. The third one, I was a hot caseman in Mount 53 and that's a person that has asbestos gloves and has the big uh, five inch, it looks like a 22 cartridge comes out of the gun. You have to bat it through the bottom of the gun mount Otherwise, it could start going around breaking legs or burning people. So okay. All right. that was interesting. And then I ended up as a trainer in Mount 53. And that's the, I sat in a, in a seat with the hand cranks to make the gun go like this. And then there was a pointer on the other side that made the gun go like this when we were in local. Okay. And then each of us would throw it into auto, which is the main battery director would take over. But I had a, a sight with crosshairs so I could see what we were aiming at. Um, all right, so we, you know what you're going to be doing on the Hopewell. Um, and take us a little bit closer to Vietnam, if you could. Okay, um, I'm in the process of writing a book on my experiences. And uh, there's an awful lot of things that we can't go into right now. But uh, the, one of the first things was we were on DeSoto Patrol. and. I was told uh, by certain people that we couldn't have been that because there was no big uh, container on the back of the ship with all kinds of equipment. Then I found out later that uh, from one of our radarmen that gentlemen in khakis with no stars, no bars, okay. no insignia came aboard, put um, cameras over our radar repeaters and the and the purpose of DeSoto Patrol is to steam toward the, the uh, beach of North Vietnam, okay. get them to light off whatever equipment that they, wow. and then pull out so that our airstrikes can, can hit it. And that is something I didn't know as when I was on board. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but we did an awful lot of um, shore bombardment from very close in. And I was uh, talking to a gentleman yesterday who said a number of destroyers had been hit by shore batteries. I'm very fortunate and my ship was never hit. Okay. Well, that's an interesting insight um, into that, um, that area of Vietnam, that portion of that theater, because often what we talk about um, is what happens in the Central Highlands or in i Corps or down in the Mekong Delta not so much what happens when you're in a destroyer or on an aircraft carrier or what, whatever. So um, were you frightened? I mean, what were you feeling when you were told, okay, we're going to take up station in the South China Sea? Well, <clears throat> I, I think like everybody else, I was uh, frightened, concerned. Uh, in fact, when, when they highlined the uh, chaplain over. A high line is, is a basket that carries personnel or, or material between ships on a, on a line. Okay. And uh, he had a, a non-denominational service. Mm -hmm. And then I asked him if, if I could talk to him and he took me to an officer stateroom and we talked a lot about God and, and purpose and that uh, was comforting. Um, but yeah, I, I was uh, very concerned that uh, I like I'm, like I'm sure everybody else was. Exactly. Yeah. yeah, and we did we operated in I core area like you talked about, mm -hmm. and four core never in two and three, and I okay. I'm not sure why. Okay. All right. Now um, you deployed in was it August, August 1964 64. through February 65. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so give us a, a little bit of a 
kind of a cross section or feel for what happened during that first tour? Well, it was all so new. Um, I, I showed you my cruise book. Uh, it was the cruise was considered, a, you know, like a, a, a cruise what we would take now. It, it was you didn't. There was no war going on, so we have a cruise book. The second tour, there was no cruise book because we were so concerned with what we had to be doing yeah. in the war that uh, there was nobody assigned to do that. Okay, and so that, I'm sorry to interrupt, but that okay. second tour lasted 66, right? So it was... March uh, 66 through August of 66. Okay, all right, and so that's the second tour, and of course it was, it was just a different tenor, it was a different time. The war is fully engaged, you're you know, still short of Tet, but there are operations going on from i -Corps all the way down to the Mekong River Delta. Can you recall some... Um, some of the actions you were involved in? Well, <clears throat> we never really knew the the terms of it. Like I say, we did a lot of shore bomb. Um, we did pull into the Mekong Delta for two days, and now Hopewell's on the Ori Agent Orange Registry. Okay. It was only two days. There are other guys that were there for, for months and months and months. Um, we, uh, one of the things that happened is we sent stakes from our galley to, to the Marines on, uh, on the beach and, uh, and fresh baked bread from our ovens. And we got back a message. It said, thank you for the stakes. God bless you for the bread. <laughs> and then they sent us a um, piece of wood that was in our mess decks with a captured Viet Cong rifle, a gas mask made out of naga hide with cellophane and, and cotton, and a sandal made from a jeep tread. Wow. Wow. It's an amazing connection. Um, you know, I, you guys razz each other a lot, Marines and sailors and airmen and, and GIs, but uh, that bond is obviously yeah, there. All in good humor. Yeah, sure. absolutely. So, um, so, so that's your time in the Navy and spending time in Vietnam. Um, what, what sorts of thoughts resonate with you down to this very day? I mean, what are the most um, profound or salient memories that you have, thoughts, maybe recollections on your time in country? Well, anytime you operate with a unit, um, you form bonds with other people. There are two fellows that I call every New Year's Day, like clockwork, and then sometimes in between. Um, there are um, ships reunions. Mm -hmm. I have a friend who was in the Army, and he said, well, there were guys transferred in and out all the time, and his unit never, ever has a reunion. Well, I feel very fortunate to... Oh, when I first when I first went active duty, they give you a dream sheet. You can ask for what type of ship you want to be okay. put on. And I said a carrier, a cruiser, or a repair ship. I wanted to be on a big ship, lots of safety. And they sent me to a World War II destroyer. And I thank God all the time that I knew every man on that ship, mainly because I was a yeoman, but uh, it, it was, it's so different. I mean, yeah. it, I, I really, really was very fortunate to be stationed on my ship. Right. So you, you've yeah. got that uh, tighter intimacy that you wouldn't have had on a big, I big aircraft so. carrier yeah. or Yankee yeah, station. Yeah, they had their, their little groups on a carrier because the carrier is like a little city. Right. So, yeah. Right. Exactly. In fact, one carrier almost cut us in half one night. Uh, uh, our, we made a wrong rudder. Uh, turn and the constellation uh, almost cut us in half. And so, you know, things can happen even out of combat. It can happen just two ships can collide or any number of things. So. Exactly, exactly. And you don't want to go into the water in the North Sea of Japan where it's, you know, very, very cold, hypothermia, right. things like that. Right. Um, so just going back, a tick. So, um, you know, you mentioned how important these connections are to this very day with people that you spent time with. You have engineered three different reunions 
four six eight one. Yes. Uh, which, which was the <coughs> member designation for the Hopewell. Um, and tell us a little bit about that and what it meant and the different places you guys spent time. Well, for uh, forever, <coughs> I would look in the VFW magazine for a reunion for my ship, the USS Hopewell, and there never was. So I decided to put one on. And I was given a list by an old World War II um, sailor from Hopewell of 33 names. When I contacted him, 15 had already passed on. So from about a 16 or 17 list, uh, we built it to 500. And <coughs> we did that before the internet, so it would have been so much easier. So that's some work right there. We'd go over to uh, Chico State and f get phone disks. And each time you sent out a letter, Somebody would say, oh, do you know this fellow from Iowa? And do you, is, is he on your list? And I would, I would take that. And uh, one example was I had this name, Alouette, J. Alouette from Louisiana. Well, I, I looked on the, and there's six of them. Okay. So I called them. The first one, no. Second one, no. Third one, no. Fourth, the sixth one. Yes, my son served on the USS Hopewell. And I said, well, why don't you tell him to please come to our reunion? I mean, you're there in Louisiana and Baton Rouge, you know, hello. Yeah. And she said, well, he won't be there. And I said, well, you know, maybe he didn't enjoy his Navy experiences, but, uh, you know, we all have life experiences and, and there's shared ex experiences. So. Right. After 20 minutes, she said, listen, he won't be there. He's in a federal prison, <laughs> and there's no way he's going to make your reunion after all of that. So that was just one person. But we did build it up, and the first reunion was very well attended at the USS Kidd, which was the sister ship for mine, DD-661. Okay. Then uh, Mary and I put one on down in San Diego. Um, one of the uh, guys that had been a seaman on my ship when I was there was now an E-9, which is way up there. Uh, he, he was a, a master chief. And I called him down in San Diego and I said, hey, uh, Earl, would you please try and get a admiral to speak at our reunion? And he goes, I will. I'll get one. He couldn't get one. Then he went down to captain. Then he went down to commander and lieutenant. He couldn't get anybody to speak. So the night of the reunion, the dinner, I guess I'm going to be the speaker, right? I don't know what, I, I'm standing in the chow line, the meal line, and I don't, what am I going to talk about? And this fellow taps me on the shoulder from behind and he says, hey, I'm your speaker. And he was an E9 in his whites, and he talked about how the Modern Navy, the Navy now, yeah. uh, owes it to us, just like we owed it to World War II. Guys. And it, it was a masterful speech, and I, I didn't have a clue he was going to be able to talk. And it all came together. It, it all, all came, came together. together. And then the last one was in Charleston that I did, okay. and we were aboard the USS Laffey, which was the ship that wouldn't die. She was hit, she was attacked by 20 two kamikazes and hit by six. Oh my goodness. And didn't go down. Okay, okay. And that was inspiring. Let's move, if we could, out of the South China Sea and we're gonna come back to, to Chico and let's pick things up there and a return to your first love, which is art. I came back to Chico State uh, and I still was in the Naval Reserve. Okay. <coughs> I became an E-6 in the Naval Reserve. I was E-5 on active duty. And uh, then I, I re revisited, uh, I was now an art major, finally, and I revisited printmaking, which is my love. And I had a wonderful, wonderful teacher, Dr. Janet E. Turner. There is a Turner Print Museum at Chico State. It's one of the largest print collections, teaching print collections in the country, about 4,000 prints, 
Some are Picassos, some are Chagalls, things like that. And she collected so her students wouldn't have to go to L.A., New York, Paris to see the latest in printmaking techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <coughs> and um, so I'm still on that board. Yeah, um, right. And um, it, it's, it, uh, so many people don't know about it, but it, yeah. it, it's a treasure and it's free. Right, and of course she um, thought very highly of you, um, you know, and your work is, is a, a printmaker. Um, now, the, the, the big elephant in the art room of, of Michael Halderson is time you spent in the Netherlands. Um, and if you could go ahead and just kind of take us through that whole timeline, because a lot of people who are watching when they hear this name are just going to go, wow. Mm -hmm. So if you could. Well, 1970 was a very good year for me. That was the year that Janet Turner um, made me her teaching assistant. <clears throat> and then I um, got a student loan of $400 and went to Europe with it. By the way, I paid back every penny. I want you to know that. Okay. Went to Europe <clears throat> with another printmaker and his wife, and I got to um, Amsterdam, Schiphol Airport, and <clears throat> looked in the phone book in Barn Holland, where M.C. Escher lives, lived, and he was in the phone book. So I called him up and I said, Mr. Escher, my name is Michael Halderson. I'm a graduate printmaker from California, I've got to see you. He goes, I just got rid of two Americans. <laughs> and I said, I've really got to see you. So he said, okay, I'll give you 15 minutes on a Friday afternoon at 3 o'clock. At 12 o'clock, I was in Barn. At 2.30 in the afternoon, I was in a taxi um, uh, in front of it well, down the street from his house, waiting for 3 o'clock. Yeah. 3 o'clock hit, I was at his door. His wife, uh, Yetta, answered it, and she was having tea with a friend. And uh, this very slight man with a white goatee, and he comes out, and he asks me if I want to see his studio. Well, hello, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah, you know. And I had brought a framed one of my prints called it was a print about pollution, and it, it, Earth Day had just happened, and, and I was so proud of it, and I wanted to give it to him. He could not take it. They were moving him into an artist residence, and he couldn't take all of his own work. Mm. So I went back there into his studio, and he said, would you be interested in seeing the blocks I'm using for my latest print? I said no, and let, no, I didn't. <laughs> I, of course, I'm in, I'm in, I'm in awe. This is it, yeah. I, I did not have his wife take a picture of me with him. I did not have him sign my, my uh, sketchbook or do a doodle. Yeah. I only took four photographs in his studio, and mainly him showing me the cherry blocks for the last print that he did, a thing called Ring Snakes, and it, it was masterful. Nice. Okay. So there's a gentleman back in Connecticut who sells Escher prints, and uh, he asked me if I would give permission to use one of, my, in his, uh, one of my photographs in his book, and I did, and it is in a, a book on Escher. Um, I've, I've got tons of other stories about Escher, but uh, yeah. that's, that, that was my experience. I was, in, I was on cloud nine, and then Unfortunately, the woman that we were traveling with said, well, we have to go to the ballet that night. And I didn't want to, but it turned out pretty good, too. So okay. I was getting my master's in printmaking. And I, my plan was to go to Mills College um, and get my MFA. Mills College would be the happy hunting ground. There's the only men on campus are professors or oh, teaching assistants, understood. and the rest of them are rich young ladies. Yeah. So hello, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But my mother asked me to answer phone at Halderson Appliance, and I was there for 34 years. Right. So I went 20 years without doing a print. Okay. 
I've done 330 some prints in my life. But the one thing, well, I learned a lot from Janet Turner, but one of the things I learned was um, to assist nonprofits. So for years, I've donated my etchings to nonprofits um, Salvation Army, Cancer Society, Heart Association, the museums around here. You know, just mm -hmm. it's my way of giving back. And the most one of my prints has ever gone for was $2,200 but mainly two to three to four hundred dollars. We've made this foray into art, but what um, is a big part of your life right now is your time spent with veterans groups. Right. Um, and this really interesting um, sort of connection between yourself and your dad in the VFW. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, um, I joined the VFW from the South China Sea in 1966, so next year I will have been a member for 50 years. But I didn't attend meetings as I was trying to, you know, be a business person, being an artist and all this. Uh. So my dad was commander in 1965 and 1966. I happened to be commander this year, which is exactly 50 years later, the same post. Um, I grew up in the old veterans building on the Esplanade here in Chico, mm -hmm. which is now going to be Monca, which is the Museum of Northern California Art. Awesome. It's, it's art and veterans. Yeah. But I'm in the VFW, I'm in Vietnam Veterans, uh, I'm in American Legion, and DAV, Disabled American Veterans. Um, I am writing a book on my Navy experiences. In fact, the word Hopewell is probably 150 times in it, if not that <laughs> little. And <coughs> it was, the way I started out, it was all vignettes, little paragraphs, like um, it, it would be a cute little saying for a paragraph to a page and a half. Yeah. And I was in the VFW with this retired Navy commander who has written eight books on the Navy, uh, David Brun, and his are very, very scholarly and very researched, and um, they're on a number of subjects uh, that most people don't write about. A lot of people write about destroyers and carriers and things like that. He writes about seaplane tenders and okay. and the wooden boats that were commandeered when World War II started. And th they're masterful. And then he has a professional artist paint uh, the covers. He'll he'll tell them what the action was like, and then then he'll say, "No, you got to change this." And, and anyway, they're masterful pieces. But he said, "No, you've got to make it chronological." You've got to make it interesting for the reader. Um, and so now we've, he showed me how to set apart different chapters, uh, the first cruise, the second cruise, life at sea, um, you know, uh, the Naval Reserve, both at the beginning and the end. Okay. And each chapter has a, <coughs> a quote. And I, I'm going to have to paraphrase this because I can't totally remember it, but it's something like from John F. Kennedy. It said, if you are a man living in America in these times, the greatest thing you can say about your life was that I served in the United States Navy. Ah. I love that one. Uh, but anyway, we're on about a page 120 or so out of 200. Okay. And he's... He's t almost typesetting it as we go. And then he, he helps me rewrite um, from what my uh, verbiage is mm -hmm. to things that are actually more succinct and will make people understand a little bit better. Yeah. And it's, it's coming along really well. And I chose one night, this, na this title came to me, Navy Days, D-A-Z-E. Like, you know, the Beatles Magical Mystery Tour. Sure. I went through in a daze. I didn't really appreciate everything as it happened. <clears throat> and my wife, Mary, goes, well, did you ever look on the Internet and see if there's another title, Navy Days? And I said, no. So I looked, and sure enough, there's one of a Canadian sailor in the Korean War who got a Dear John letter and decided to 
um, join the Navy. I'd already been in the Navy when I got my Dear John letter. And that's another story. Yeah. But um, so we looked and there's this Navy Days, but there's a billion of them. I mean, everybody's written this thing called Navy Days. It just came to me. I mean, I did not take it off the internet, <laughs> honest. But it's, it's Navy Days, young man from Northern California comes of age on a naval destroyer during Vietnam. Got so it. it's got okay. a lot yeah, more succinct. I uh, think you've got that one nailed down pretty well. So do we have a, an idea of when the book is going to be released? The 12th. Okay. So of never. No, uh, yeah. no, I'm kidding. I always do that to people. But <laughs> I really want to have it done by my next ship's reunion, which is in October of 2016 in okay. Branson, Missouri. Oh, cool. I want to be there. So I would love to have it uh, done by then. Sounds good. And, and congratulations. Putting a book together is a, is a really big deal. Well, we get together about once a week for about four hours. And sometimes it, that four hours, take you'd go through a paragraph and a half yeah. just trying to make it correct. Uh, like, like one of the fellows, um, I put in my book that we came back to the United States States early. Well, okay, the, the thing that precipitated it was I said, well, you know, you've got the National Defense Medal, and you've got the Vietnam Service Medal, and you've got the Vietnam Campaign Medal. And he goes, no, I don't have the Campaign Medal. I said, what are you talking about? And he said, you have to have been in Vietnam six months or more to get the Campaign Medal. Well, I had two tours, so I had it, but he didn't have it. And I said, well, well, what happened? And he said, well, we came back early to escort the Ariskany, which is a carrier, okay. back to the States after her huge fire. Yeah. And I said, gosh, I don't remember that. So as we're working on the book, uh, I said, you know, babe, I don't remember that. And he says, well, why don't we go on the internet and take a look? So you get out of the book and you go on the internet and there it is. We came back in August of 66. The Ariskany's fire was October of 66. Oh, okay. His memory was off. Okay. But I was going to put it as, you know, gospel truth. Yeah. So yeah, I, I learned a valuable lesson about uh, editorial ship there. So uh, one of the things that um, you had mentioned a little bit earlier was um, something you think about, something that you've defined as the bravest thing you've done in your life. You want to jump on that? Well, it, it's kind of tongue in cheek, but it is, uh, when I was newly aboard Hopewell, I was a mess cook, like I said earlier, and I was making toast on a rotating toaster on the bulkhead at the chow line. Okay. And this guy comes along and he elbows me right out of the way. And I, I said, hey, what are you doing? And he goes, mind your pay grade, lad. Well, I didn't know what that meant exactly, but I kind of did. The, you know, he must be superior to me in every way. So that, later that day, I'm going up the forecastle toward one of the gun mounts, and I see him working on a gun. And I said to somebody, I said, what is he, a third class or a second class gunner's mate? And he, no, he's a, he's a seaman trying to be a gunner's mate. Well, I'm a seaman, so okay. we're the same pay grade. So the next day, he, he comes down and he does the same thing. And so I said, well, mind your pay grade, lad, like an idiot. And uh, he, he looked at me and he had, you had to have seen him. He's got the steel blue eyes that when he looks at you, it goes 20 feet through you. Gotcha. And he says, sometime today, I'm going to put your nose on the other side of your head. So what are the chances? Later that day, I'm walking up the port side of the ship. He's walking down the port side of the ship. We meet in no man's land. You cannot see us from the front, uh, forward. forward. Can't see us from aft. There is a metal walkway above us right we're nobody can see that i'm going to be killed and thrown into the bay <laughs> and so i look at him 
And I said the bravest thing I've ever said. I said, uh, I'm not afraid of you, which was a well, bold-faced lie. And he looked at me and he goes, well, I'm not afraid of you either. And we just kind of, I don't know how I turned with my knees knocking as hard as they were, but, <laughs> and <laughs> that was the bravest thing I've ever done. Well done, sir. So, um, the, the other thing you wanted to be able to, to say a few things about was, you know, it becomes sort of part of the, the, the lineage of, of uh, popular history vis-a-vis -vis, uh, First World War, Second World War, and being a, a GI or a sailor or a Marine overseas, every once in a while, what appears is that Dear John letter. And so it did to me. Um, <coughs> I was at electronics technician school, then went to Hopewell, was there about a month and a half, and then we deployed for Westpac uh, on our way to Vietnam. And in the interim, I had gone from being a, a mess cook to a yeoman. And uh, certain people on the ship took exception to that, and so as we were in Subic Bay, in the Philippines at the EM Club, I was drinking with Little Doc, and uh, beers were a dime and mixed drinks were a quarter. So we were, you know, we were getting pretty happy. At four o'clock, he had to go back to the ship and give VD shots. Okay. I didn't go with him to do that. So I'm sitting there all by myself, and some of the cooks that took exception to me leaving their decided to, uh, well, when the shore patrol found me, I okay. was in the bushes outside, the, and my tooth had been sheared off. And oh the next morning we got underway for Vietnam again. So if I'd been in port more than two weeks, I'd had, my sea legs were gone, so I had to take Dramamine. Well, I couldn't get to my Dramamine. I was hung over, my mouth was cut up, and my tooth was sheared off. And there's no way I can get to a base dentist. I mean, we're gone. So finally, they heloed me over to the carrier to take care of it, but that's another story. So anyway, I get one letter in mail call, and it's from my girlfriend. And I, I said, before I even opened it up, I said, you know, before, I'm going to write her and tell her this is the best medicine I could have gotten for my four ills. And I open it up and it goes, Dear Mike, Ralph and I have been going steady now for a month. <laughs> it was really a bad day. <laughs> now this is the same girl who had written me at Officer Candidate School the year before the summer before, saying, I will love you forever. Of course, yes. Yeah. That does it for our uh, episode of Valid of Vietnam. Michael, I want to thank you so much for your service and your time. Welcome home.